and today it's kind of a it's kind of a look ahead. We've been spending the last few weeks looking at how do we set ourselves up for 2024, uh, well and truly, Lord willing, at least out of the kind of COVID era of lockdowns and whatnot. Again, Lord willing, please Lord. Uh, although I heard about a new straighten going around, but people don't seem to be orienting their lives around. COVID anymore, like there were even there's a bit, a bit of that last year, even though we didn't really, I uh, didn't really hit South Australia too hard last year. There's still a little bit of that going around. Doesn't seem to be so much this year. However, <clears throat> the kind of, uh, not malaise, but the kind of uh, the rest that we tend to, tend to enjoy uh, during COVID as a culture seems to have lasted through. The selfishness that we already had before COVID, that we really embraced during COVID. Like what an amazing excuse to not do something. I've got a little bit of scratchy throat. Better not, just in case. Get used to working from home, get used to working a lot less, uh, get used to operating at like a you know, 90%, 80%, 50% capacity and kind of going, this is great. I can really coast. And unfortunately, that didn't just seep into our vocation, didn't just seep into our kind of civic responsibilities, it has seeped into how we approach God, how we approach one another. That was an amazing catch. <coughs> spot the athlete. <laughs> spot, the, spot the Crows player. Um, and so we spent the last few weeks looking at, well, what does it look like to meditate on the character of God? on the works of God, on the Word of God. What does it look like to, now I love the, the uh, Peter Adams, to luxuriate on the things of God. It was wonderful. Last week we looked at, what does it look like to be the family of God? What does it look like to love one another? Or what does it mean to love one another? Today we're going to be looking at, at, at a similar topic, that topic of how do we apply the gospel in our lives, both for our relationship with God, our relationship with one another, our relationship with the world around us, with the place and the people, the context, <clears throat> the workplace, the family, the neighbourhood, the social groups that God has placed us in? How do we respond to the gospel, apply the gospel and be propelled in a spirit-empowered fashion by the gospel? So often we... We think about the gospel as Christians. We think about, well, yes, I, I heard the gospel. I responded to the gospel. Now I put the gospel in a drawer, put it away. That was, that, that's done and dusted. Now I check that box, gospel done. And now I go to try to figure out my life. And especially, again, I'd say, especially post-COVID, people are going, what, what am I supposed to do with life? What, what is normal? Do I try to get back to what I was doing before? Is this new normal? Does normal even exist? What does that even mean? What am I supposed to do with my life? If my life has radically changed, if your, uh, again, your vocational direction changed, your relational direction changed, maybe your political direction changed. And so you're going, well, I'm a different person to who I was and now I don't know what I'm supposed to be doing. I'll put it to you. And again, if you've had a big week or I know many of you are, um, starting new jobs tomorrow. Many of you have kids starting school tomorrow, either again or for the very first time. And so your minds are kind of full of the stuff of life at the moment. So what I don't want to do is try to cram more stuff in there. What I'm hoping to do today is to help go over again the foundation of our lives, which is the gospel. Again, last week we looked at every heart having a home. We saw how radically different church family is to anything else. The kind of community that brings God glory, the kind of community, the kind of family where love is on display, like a, a tangible, visible kind of love. that You can see it <clears throat> to where Jesus commands us to love one another like He's loved us. And He says, everybody's gonna know that you belong to me by that love. And so it's a love that can be seen. It's a city set on a hill. It's a lamp on a lampstand. It's that kind of love. It's a community where people don't think of themselves more highly than others. It's a kind of community, kind of family I am keen for my kids to grow up in is around people like you who love other people, who hold each other in your hearts. 
That's the community I want my kids to grow up in so that they see it, so that they hear it, so that they experience it, so that they are loved by more than just me and my wife, but by you. And likewise, we, we want to be a community where you are loved, where you hold another in your heart and where you are held in other people's hearts. And your kids and their kids. It's a kind of community that only comes as we take the gospel out of the drawer, we put it in at salvation, and we begin to live in light of, or like we talk about here, we apply the gospel. We actually put the gospel into action, put the gospel into practice. And so today we're going to be looking at spirit-empowered gospel application. <clears throat> and again, we're going over that foundation again for 2024. Next, starting next week, we're going to be looking at some of the assurances we have. It's going to be such an encouraging... Oh, no, no, wait. Next, this month, we're going to be looking at some of the, the core features of church. So why do we do communion? Why do we do baptism? Lord, we will have a bunch of baptisms as well. Uh, and then after that, we're going to be looking at some of the assurances we have in Jesus, which is going to be just a super encouraging start to the year. Today, we're going to be in 1 Peter. <clears throat> this is chapter 1 from verse 22. And this is what Peter writes. It says, Having purified your souls by your obedience to the truth, for a sincere brotherly love, love one another earnestly from a pure heart. Since you've been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable, through the living and abiding Word of God, for all flesh is like grass, and all its glory like the flower of grass. The grass withers, the flower falls, but the Word of the Lord remains forever. And this Word is the good news that was preached to you. So put away all malice and all deceit and hypocrisy and envy and all slander like newborn infants long for the, for the pure spiritual milk that by it you may grow up into salvation if indeed you have tasted that the Lord is good. Let's pray and let's see what God would have for us today. And so Father, again, we want to thank you for these scriptures. Thank you that you don't leave us floundering or trying to figure things out by ourselves. You've given us your scriptures. You've given us your word. You've given us your spirit. And today, so today, Father, we want to have open hearts and minds, receptive spirits to your Holy Spirit. We'll be shaped by your scriptures, conformed to the likeness of your word. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So uh, in the kids' ministry today, they're watching a movie. It goes for 90 minutes, so I figure. If we could spend a bit more time today. No, I'm just joking. That's not. <clears throat> Let's have a look. This is an amazing piece of Scripture because it, uh, you hear for, if, because. Peter's making a kind of a logical progression. He starts with the gospel. He starts with your state now your redeemedness, your justifiedness, your holiness, your spotlessness, your perfection. But because you worked your way up some moral ladder, but because you went away and got your life in order and came back and presented yourself to God, <clears throat> but because of what Jesus has done, His perfect sacrifice applied to your account. Not wiping the slate clean, not you were in debt and now you're at zero, but from debt to perfection, from death to eternal life. Having purified your souls. So he's not saying that you have done this. He's saying, but your, your souls are now pure. Your soul is the all of your life. It's everything about you. It's your body, your mind, your spirit that makes a soul. It says your soul's been purified by what Jesus has done. He, he says, having purified your souls by your obedience to the truth for a sincere brotherly love. And so when he talks about obedience to the truth, again, 
going over that foundation again of what is the gospel. It is our repentance, our conforming to the mind of Christ, that we abandon our old way, trying to reach up to God and receive what He has done for us. It's in, it's in the living the new way of life. You have been made new and now you are living as a new creation. He says, to the truth, again, uh, for, for a sincere brotherly love. He says, not being a hypocrite, for brotherly love. It's not just a side effect, it's a stated goal. This is one of the reasons God has saved us in Christ is so that we would love one another. And brotherly love doesn't let the women off the hook. This brotherly love is the kind of love the siblings have. That's what he's saying. He's saying it's not just your biological brothers you need to have love for, it's now you are in a new family and we are brothers and sisters. Little brothers and sisters of our adopted big brother. Sons and daughters of God Most High. He's, he's, he's reminding us of who you are. He's reminding us of the gospel before he gets on to the, what do we do? How do we live? What are we for? It's a stated goal. It's for brotherly love. And then verse 22, he says, because of this, love one another deeply from the heart. It's a huge pillar of Scripture. We looked at this extensively last week. Last week was the what. This week is going to be the how. Love one another deeply from the heart. Uh, your translation might say fervently. It's this idea that you are doing it to the maximum level. I don't know if you've ever uh, been in the gym or done PT and right when you can't do anything else, you're like, I'm totally exhausted. And your PT goes, one more rep, one more rep. You're like, I can't do any more reps. That's what he's talking about. You're at the end of yourself. That's how, that's how deep and how, how broad our love is for one another. So that's what Peter here is encouraging us into, even commanding us into. Again, Jesus says, how will people know that you're my disciples? If you love one another. What is a kind of love? It's costly love. It's not selfish love. It's not self-serving love. It's not a love that puts me first. It's not a if it's convenient kind of love. It's fervent love. Deep love. There are lots and lots of one another's in Scripture. We go over these quite regularly uh, here at, at City Light to remind ourselves when, Paul, when Peter writes, love one another deeply from the heart, he is echoing the many one another's of Scripture that show us how we are to love one another. Like when Jesus says in, in Mark 9, be at peace with one another. Or he says, don't grumble with one another in John 6. Paul writes in Romans 12, be of the same mind as one another. Have unity. We have unity with Christ. We gain the mind of Christ. And he says, have unity with one another as well. Romans 15, accept one another. 1 Corinthians, wait for one another. Don't bite or devour or consume one another. He says, family, don't eat one another. Don't consume one another. We're not in a community so that we can use people to achieve our goals. But rather the goal is that the love that we have for one another would be so stark, so countercultural, so much like Jesus that other people would know that we belong to Him. That's the goal for brotherly love. That's the goal. Don't boastfully challenge or envy one another. Gently, patiently tolerate one another, Ephesians 4. Be kind, tender-hearted and forgiving for one another, also Ephesians 4. Bear with one another. Forgive one another, Colossians 3. See good for one another. Don't repay evil for evil, Thessalonians. Don't grumble against one another, James 4. And confess sin to one another, James 5. Lots of one another's. There are more one another's. Serve one another, Galatians 5. Tolerate one another. Seems a little negative. But it says, tolerate one another in love, Ephesians 4. Be devoted to one another in love, Romans 12. What's that devotion? What do we make plans around? What do we spend time doing? What are we strategic and intentional about? About loving one another. 
about 15% stress this attitude of humility as well. So it's outdo one another in showing honour. It's like the one time Paul says, this is how brothers and sisters are to be competitive with one another in showing honour. Regard one another as more important than yourselves. Looked at this last week, Philippians 2. Serve one another. Wash one another's feet, John 13. Be subject to one another, Ephesians 5. Clothe yourselves in humility to one another, later on in 1 Peter. Lots of one another's. There's heaps of other, other one another's, like don't lie to one another, speak the truth to one another, bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. Greet one another with a kiss, actually a bunch of times, maybe more cultural there, but we can apply it contextually. Encourage and build up one another. Stimulate one another to love and good deeds. Pray for one another. One of the marks of love is that you pray for someone else. Be hospitable to one another. And then love one another, John 13. Love one another, John 15. Love one another, John 15 again. Love one another, Romans 13. Love one another, 1 Thessalonians 3. Love one another, 1 Thessalonians 4. Love one another in our passage today. Love one another, 1 John 3. Love one another, 1 John 4. Love one another, Love one another, love one another. How we live with each other, with one another, is central to how we live out, how we work out, how we apply the gospel. It's central to what Jesus came to purchase, a people for himself. Central to our mission as light bearers. What is the light? What are the good works that we are to perform before others so they may see those good works and give glory to our Father in heaven? It is the love that we have for one another. We are a community within a community, a city within a city. We're we're in a glass house so the people on all sides could look in. We should be a window into what the world could look like subject to King Jesus and it should look like love. Peter goes on, he says uh, in chapter two, we're saved to something. So God wants to show through us, his love through us, uh, that we are agents of reconciliation in the world. So what does Peter say? He says, so put away, you are saved. You are redeemed, you are loved. You've been made spotless, pure, blameless, holy, righteous. Because of that, live like people who are pure and blameless and spotless and righteous. Because you're a new creation, live like people who are a new creation. And what does it look like? It looks like that life is marked by a love like Jesus loves, in community, with one another. So, because of this, he says, Put away all malice and all deceit and all hypocrisy and envy and slander. So malice is to hurt someone with your words or with your activity. It says, put, it, put that away. That's the old self. That's the old creation. That is of the unredeemed. That's not you. There's to be no malice in the family of God because we apply the gospel. We haven't been treated with malice even though we're His enemies. We're treated with love. Therefore, we don't treat others with malice. We treat them with love. So put away all deceit. So to try to gain advantage or preserve some sort of position by not being truthful with others. He says, because you know the truth, therefore be truthful, be people of truth. I actually think this is one of the, <clears throat> this is one of the best, most effective ways to put our faith on display to a world that is, desperately looking for a, uh, something to tether their life to or an anchor for their life. They're looking for truth. In the age of misinformation and disinformation, not knowing what to do, not knowing where to go, not knowing who to trust, people are looking for truth. I actually think this is one of the reasons that so many people have started going to church where they've never been in church before. I've, met, I've mentioned this last week. I've met people who, over the last year in particular, 18 months, but last year, and, and more and more, month on month, people walking into 
our church gatherings like this, say, oh, so what brought you here? Uh, I don't know. Never been to church before in my life. But I just sensed that there's something I'm missing. I just sensed that I need, I need the truth. I think the truth is we should be the least gullible people because we don't need things to tether ourselves to. We've got the most wonderful, amazing, phenomenal news. Hypocrisy, so wanting to be known for what isn't true, for what isn't right. We have no need to be hypocritical. We don't need to, be, to make ourselves look like something that we're not. We have been loved while we were still sinners. Christ died for us. While we were his enemies, he treated us like family and he adopted us into his family. The God of the universe who breathes, who speaks and, and trillions of stars come into existence in obedience to his voice. He loves you. What's and all, for every flaw, every sin he's paid for, he's made you pure and spotless and blameless and holy. We weren't lovely, although he loved us and he has made us lovely. We, don't, we can get rid of all hypocrisy. We don't need it because we apply the gospel in our lives. We can, let, we can be truly known. We can let people know us. You can get rid of that veil. You can get rid of that mask. You can get rid of that carefully curated projection of who you want the world to see of you, preventing you from actually being known and actually being loved by others. Constantly in fear, what if they saw behind the mask? What if they see under the veil? They see who I really am. Actually, we can get rid of that veil. Because Jesus already loves the unveiled you. He loves the unmasked you. And he is working by his spirit in partnership with the community he's put you in to make you more and more like Jesus. But if all people see is the well put together version of us that doesn't actually exist, there's some avatar of us, then we should lose the benefit, the benefit of community. In fact, we start to fear community. Because if people knew what we really thought or what we had really done, then we wouldn't be accepted. Uh, actually, this is the community where every heart has a home. This is a community to live lives laid bare. This is a community to bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ, which means we need people to bear burdens and we need burdens to bear. If we don't have your burdens, we can't fulfill the law of Christ. Put away all hypocrisy, he says. Put away all envy, which is a desire for privilege or benefit that belongs to somebody else or somebody else's earned, or even that by luck somebody else has come across. When we think about our lives, when we think, think about how is life going right now, when we have, we looked at a couple of weeks ago, when we have that zoomed out perspective and we see what we have, we see that we have Jesus. We have everything. But we also have, I mean, on a historic scale and on a geographic scale, we have almost unprecedented peace in the city in which we live. It would be unfathomable, the lives we live, to most people in the world and throughout history. Uh, if we have health, we have a community that loves us, that knows us, points us to Jesus, prays for us, bears our burdens. We, we are already the, we're already the most uh, well-off, the most rich people. I don't mean that in a financial sense necessarily, although we are also among the most rich people who have ever lived. But in terms of what we have, we, are, we have so, so much what we tend to do is we look at what we don't have and we compare to people who have more than us only in the areas of our lack, not even considering their lives as a whole. He says, you have everything already. You have everything. And the inheritance is coming. 
Paul writes and says, man, these light and momentary troubles, he says they're achieving for us an eternal weight of glory. So even if you, even if you are suffering deeply and immensely, what you already have and what you have stored up for you, Paul says it's immeasurably, it's immeasurable. He says when we apply the gospel, we don't envy others. We can be happy for other people's success where we have failed or when they have things even that they don't deserve or even things that are easy for everybody but somehow are challenging for us. And we can grieve our loss at the same time as being happy for other people's gain. So it's put away slander. So essentially, revenge and self-enhancement. So sometimes slander is kind of an outworking of the previous four, like a deep desire to draw attention to somebody else's failings when they seem to be kind of progressing more than us or to draw away from our own failings. Again, it's just part of that mask that we put up by diverting attention away to somebody else. So we, we can't slander somebody else. Jesus tells this parable where he says, uh, there's, a, there's a servant who owes a significant amount of money, unable to pay it back in lifetimes of working and he's forgiven. And he goes to his fellow servant who owes him just a little bit. The servant's also unable to pay and he throws him into jail until he pays it back. And Peter's just reflecting on that parable and he says, that's not us. We've been forgiven. We've been forgiven an unpayable debt. How can we hold something against anybody else? We can't do it. We're the unoffendable because we have already provided such offence against the Holy God and He has forgiven us and reconciled us to Himself and brought us into His family. And in light of that, as we apply that to our lives, we likewise don't slander others. How do we put these things away? He says, since you have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable, through the living and abiding Word of God. For all flesh is like grass, that's us, we're the grass and all its glory like the flower of grass. So the most glorious thing we have is when we can flower and, and there it is. And it says all the grass withers and the flower falls. This is why when we're operating in the flesh, we want to see, we want everyone to see the glory of our flower. We're like, when, when we forget about our new createdness, we forget about our forgiveness, we forget about our reconciliation with God, we forget that we're already made new. We forget that we're already accepted. When we try to put on this mask, this veil, this avatar, we, that's our flower. We try to put it out there and say, check out our flower. Look how good we are. Look how glorious we are. Love us for the flower. Love me. Know me for my flower. And Peter's just echoing the psalmist. He says, that flower's dead in a matter of days. Our glory is not in a flower. Our glory is in what abides Forever, what is imperishable. You are born again, he says. A new creation. Not the same as you were before. We don't glory in what we can produce in our own power. We glory and we revel and we luxuriate in the word and the work and the character of God. And then we apply that in our lives, how we live and how we love one another. This is it. He says. Uh, but the word of the Lord remains forever. And this word is the good news that was preached to you. This word is the gospel. That's why we're talking about we are gospel people. We don't just apply the gospel for salvation. Again, put it in a drawer and go, we're, we're done. But because we are gospel people, we live in light of it every day. It is a foundation. It's a thing that's right in front of us. It's, a, it's the filter through which we see the world. So we look at each other, we don't see one another from a fleshy perspective. Although we once viewed Jesus this way, we do so no longer. We view each other through the filter of the gospel. It filters everything we see. We don't live with a mask, we live with a filter, gospel filter. It changes everything, impacts everything. So how do we put these things away? How do we put away slander and malice and envy? 
we rely on the gospel. The gospel that brought us from death to life is the gospel we apply in the new life. We never graduate from the gospel. We are a gospel people. It's the good news of Jesus. Writer of Hebrews tells us we've got to fix our eyes on Jesus. He's the author of our faith. Again, not just to put it in a box and it's done in the past. He's also the perfecter of our faith. And so in the intermediate time between the author and the perfection, we live with eyes fixed on Jesus. And even when we attain perfection at his coming, we still fix our eyes on him. It's the most wonderful thing. This is how we apply the gospel. We remember how great is the salvation we have received and experienced. And we walk in light of that. We go to our heavenly Father in light of that. When we pray, we're praying in light of the gospel. We speak to one another. We speak to one another in light of the gospel. When we go to work, we work in light of the gospel. Does that make sense? What we want to do is try to, like we looked at a few weeks ago, we think even, we want to think in light of the gospel. We're not better than others. We've been forgiven, therefore we must forgive. It's what it looks like to, it's one of the ways we apply the gospel. As we say often when we talk about forgiveness, forgiveness doesn't mean necessarily a reconciled relationship. But it does mean you don't hold that against them anymore because God doesn't hold any of your sin against you. How can we hold malice towards a brother or a sister even when the sin is great, when we remember how wretched our own soul was and how much we've been forgiven? We can't do it. Again, when the person's not safe, we need to have good boundaries. But that doesn't stop us forgiving. How can you envy someone else's fortune when you remember the, wage, the wages of your sin is death? But we haven't been given our wages. We've been given Jesus' wages. We've been given his inheritance. How can we envy anybody when we know what Christ has purchased for us? While we try to gain position or advantage through hypocrisy or deceit so that others would think well of us, when the God of the universe already thinks well of you. You already have his favour. You already has, have his affection. You already have his love. You already have his attention. He loves you. And when we live in light of that, it diminishes our need for other people to think well of us. We repent when we're wrong. One of the hardest things to do from when you're a kid, probably to even now, is to repent. Or even just to, to own up to something, to say, oh, I, I have done, I've done wrong. Especially when we are, we've done wrong to someone who's also wronged us. And then we kind of, you know, we equivocate and we kind of, we try, to get, we, we try to balance a scale somehow rather than just saying, because of the gospel, when we apply the gospel in our lives, we know we are already loved, that Jesus has forgiven every sin. Therefore, we can, we can put it all out there. We can, we can acknowledge all of our flaws because we are deeply flawed and more deeply loved. We are sinful and more deeply forgiven. It's wonderful. We don't have to. In fact, it's counterproductive for us to try to project a different image of what we want to be known as rather than who we really are. Now, I'm not saying that well, you're, just, you're awesome just as you are. So the world's going to love you just as you are and that you don't need to grow or change. Uh, not at all. Not at all. We'll, we'll, see in a, we'll see in a minute. There is still growth. We've not yet attained perfection. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying in terms of the love that we have for one another. We don't need to hide. And once we are known, we can point each other as we really are towards Jesus. We can call out sin in someone else's life, lives, someone else's life, without being a hypocrite, hiding sin in my own life. They can call out sin in my life, even if they're a sinner. In fact, because they are. 
because we are each trying to point each other towards Jesus. Does it make sense? What do you think it's going to look like if just your family starts living like this? Or what's it going to do in your discipleship group if just your discipleship group started living like this? Putting the gospel out of the drawer, dusting it off, and using it as a filter through which we view and we pursue every thought, action, relationship, and word. What would it do to a whole community like this if we all start living like this? I'll tell you again, we are already a family living in a glass house that everybody, the whole world can look in. That's our job, is to be that prophetic city on a hill that gives light to everyone. Can't be hidden. That's the goal. And the goal is that our love would be so tangible, we'd hold each other in our hearts so tightly, so, so, so costly, so fervently, so intentionally, that when people see from the outside, it is a window into how the world would be with Jesus as king. Again, not perfect, but when we fail, or when we fall, or when we sin, we repent and we forgive. And repentance and forgiveness is a thing that our world desperately needs, needs to see us do. If we're too busy projecting a carefully curated version of ourselves, they'll never see forgiveness, they'll never see repentance, they'll never see the gospel. And so what kind of lover are you? Is your life marked by love? My goal when I'm hanging out with my kids is people look at me and, and think, this guy loves his kids. When I'm hanging out with my wife, my goal is, not so that people go, wow, what a great guy, but because the, the love is the goal, right? When I hang out with my wife, I want to love my wife so well that anyone looking would say, that guy loves his wife. There's a tip for you, Dan. Nearly married. <laughs> that guy loves his wife. When we're in community here, like gathered, the goal is that Anybody walking into this community would say, these people love one another deeply from the heart. How could, they, how could they love in such a costly way? Look how they forgive one another. Look how they repent to one another and own up to theirs. Look at how they have no veil, no mask. Who are these people? These are Jesus people. He goes, since then, you have been born again. By the, oh, wait, 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 let me read the scripture. Uh, so, verse 1, chapter 2. In light of this good news, in light of Jesus, who is the Word, who has taken your sin upon Himself, taken your wages and paid our death, gifted you His wages, eternal life, holiness, righteousness. In light of this, He says, Put away all malice and deceit, hypocrisy, envy, slander. Like newborn infants, long for the pure spiritual milk that by it you may grow up into salvation. If, or the word here if is more like because, because indeed you have tasted that the Lord is good. So because you've tasted that the Lord is good, because you've experienced the wonder of His love and His salvation, long for His good news to be evidence in your lives. Long to grow deeper into its goodness. Long to marvel at His excellencies. Long to be consumed with His beauty. Long to have the Holy Spirit bring His work to completion in you. Long to live out the gospel. Because of what Jesus has done to you, because you've tasted and seen that God is good. Long. Long. Like a newborn infant longs for milk with the same kind of desperation. Everybody in the house knows this baby wants milk. Your next door neighbour probably knows. This is the kind of longing and desperation. I'm going to die if I don't get it. That's what Peter's talking about here. It's the only thing that will, enable us, that will enable us to do what God's telling us to do. 
It says you've been born again by the Word of God. Long for the Word of God. That's Jesus. Since you began your life with the Gospel, sustain your life with the Gospel. Since you've been born again, live as those born again. Since you're a new creation, live as a new creation. Since you are loved, go and love. Since you're forgiven, go and forgive. Am I labouring the point too much? We apply the Gospel. This is the key. Uh, Disparate desires can't exist in the same heart. So longing for God and the things of God and to, and to love others like we have been loved, those things can't flourish in the same heart as malice and envy and deception and greed. So if you've been wronged, apply the gospel and forgive. If you have malice, apply the gospel and consider, consider others more valuable than yourself. If you're a liar, Apply the gospel. Remember that God himself thinks well of you. You don't need to look good in front of people. This will be costly. Because we, we like to make our lives better or, or easier, more comfortable, or to hold on to things that we like. But those are things that might be costing us actual loving community. And the result will be, he says, you will grow up into salvation. Not that, you will, not that you will attain salvation, but that you have salvation. Kind of like when shoe shopping with my kids this week. Um, one of our kids, we bought shoes that are too big, just by one size, because the size beneath was too small. And he will grow into what he already has. Or maybe you've got kids starting school this year and you buy a shirt that looks a little bit balloony on them. By the end of the year, it looks too small on them. Something you already have and you grow into it. That's what he's talking about here. You have salvation and you grow into it. You are a new creation and you grow into it. You have Jesus and you grow into his likeness. Can't put the gospel in a drawer and leave it away because we're done with it. We apply it every day. Remember how great is this salvation. Let's pray together. Father God, I want to thank you for your kindness to us in Jesus. You've saved us. You haven't treated us like we ought to be treated. And so we thank you. You've loved us so perfectly, so amazingly, so lovingly. And so Father, uh, in light of what you've done for us, because we have tasted that you, you are good. You're good in your own right and you are certainly good to us. And so help us, please. Help us love one another deeply from the heart like siblings because you've made us siblings. Help us to live as the new creations you have made us. Help us to live in the power of the Spirit living in us. Help us to live in light of the good news that we have heard, we have received, we have experienced. All of these one another's, Father, please, would you help them to be marks, banners over our community? We would be known as the people of love, not so that we get puffed up, but because love is so evident and tangible here. Help us, Father, to do the hard work of uh, deconstructing our carefully curated projections of how we want to be known, lay those down so that we can be truly known by one another. Thank you that though you know us, through the veil, you love us. You've forgiven us. You've received us into your family. So help us likewise to receive one another into our hearts so that all people will know that we belong to you, so that your name is glorified throughout the earth. And we pray this in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen.